Hello. I'm so glad y'all are here. I wish I was there, but I'm there through here, if that makes any sense at all. Okay, so the real idea behind this was to live stream this, and then we realized the technical difficulties made it about 50-50 whether or not y'all would even have class or whether or not, because we were live streaming, it went kaput. And so we decided that I would tape this right before class started. So in a sense, I'm ahead because I'm in a different time zone, but I'm also ahead because I'm taping this a, a little bit early. Um, the, the final straw on that, by the way, was the fact that the entire electrical grid went out yesterday and won't be fixed for some buildings uh, until Wednesday. So what I've done is I've come into this incredible church that's almost a thousand years old, and I'm using it to teach. Now, we're back to our regular series, and I've done the PowerPoint, but the problem I've got is I don't have an ability to have the PowerPoint behind me here for you to see it. So what I'm doing is I'm giving this video to Pastor Brent and I'm giving the PowerPoint to Pastor Brent in hopes that he can somehow mesh them together for you. Maybe he can. If he can, we should all applaud. If he cannot, then uh, I can't throw any rocks because I sure couldn't do it or I would have done it. So um, here's, but it gets worse because I had shot some video to put in play for you from the British Museum, but I'm not gonna be able to put it in here because it's just not gonna work. And then I've got some songs that are cut that I'm gonna play for you, but those songs, Brent may have to put them in independently. I don't know that the sound's gonna really work well to, to play through this. So we may have to like come off of me and just play it out of the PowerPoint and then come back with me. So got all of that. Can I just tell you, I'm really stoked to get back soon with you guys. It's been an incredible vacation, but truly we've missed you guys. Special shout out to the folks who've taught, Pastor Jarrett, David Capes, uh, uh, while we've been able to be gone on this family vacation, it's been wonderful. Now, this is better Bible study, but while we've been doing that through hermeneutics, we're doing it a little differently today. Today, I'm looking more at Bible themes, or specifically one Bible theme. I want to look at the theme of an idea as it's laced throughout Scripture. And so that theme of an idea is the idea of time. Now, time maybe is especially appropriate for me because I'm standing in this building that's so old and I've been around all these things. So this building's like on a road and the road for this building used to be the road from Yarnton, where I am today, to Oxford, which is like four or five miles away. And it was on this road that King Charles I had his major retreat when the armies of parliament were chasing him down. Uh, this was like a critical time in history for Western civilization. King Charles's daddy had been King James, who'd done the King James version of the Bible. King James gave birth to King, or he didn't give birth, his wife gave birth, but had King Charles as a son. And history records that Charles wasn't all that bright. But Charles was snuggling up close to the king of Spain. And the king of Spain would only snuggle up close to Charles if Charles was friendly with Catholicism. The problem is, at the time, England was full of a bunch of Protestants. They were Presbyterians, and they were Puritans, and they were Baptists. And, and so, ultimately, uh, uh, the king starts pushing all of his religion. He marries a Catholic daughter or a Catholic uh, wife and, and King Charles dissolves parliament, tells parliament they can't have anything to do with him. Well, then he starts to go to war and he can't go to war without raising money. So he's got to go to parliament. Now you, parliament, he's 
got to raise the taxes. So he reinstalls parliament. Oliver Cromwell becomes the speaker and he just goes after the king and says, okay, you've usurped too much authority. Parliament needs to run this country, not you. And uh, that clash set off a British civil war that lasted for nearly a decade. And that happened just right out here. This is in the 16, at that point, the Civil War, 1640s. But as a result, I mean, from the 1610s and 20s, all of these religious persecuted people were fleeing England and coming to the U.S., and that's when the pilgrims fled and came to the U.S. And that's when all of these different religious groups trying to find religious liberty. And of course, uh, uh, because the Protestants sometimes were prosecuting the Catholic, persecuting the Catholics, Catholics persecuting the Protestants, there were even some Catholics who fled. Lord Baltimore came and started uh, 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 an area, a, a colony, if you will, uh, that um, he named after Queen Mary, who had been... Uh, the Catholic queen, uh, uh, named after, of course, Mary, the mother of Jesus. So Lord Baltimore established the land for Mary, Maryland, or Maryland as we call it now. So I've got history in my brain going through all of this kind of stuff. And it's important because this time is in a sense a history lesson. And so I want to look at it in three ways. I want to look at first God and time. And then I want to look second at people and time. And then the third thing we'll discuss is history and time. So with those three areas of, of covering today, let's start with God and time. The Bible speaks of time in an interesting way in relationship to God. God is, we're told, the creator of time. God actually created time. Time was not until God made time. And we read this in Genesis in the creation account. This is some of the important message that's there in Genesis chapter 1, where it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form. It was void. Darkness is over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God hovers over the face of the waters. And God says, you remember, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good. God separated the light from the dark. And God called the light day. And the darkness he called night. There was evening. There was morning, and it's the first day. See, God established time. There wasn't a day. There wasn't a time before that. That's the first time. And so we've got God creating time, but beyond that, we understand biblically that people who are part of creation, people are under time even as God is beyond time. And you get this theme through scripture as well. 2 Peter 3.8 has that passage that says, don't overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord, one day is like a thousand years. A thousand years is like one day. Now, when I was, um, when I was young, I used to take that, and wonder if it might be literal, so that literally, when we have a thousand years, that's one day to the Lord. So then I'd start doing the math, and I'd try to figure out, you know, when the end of days were coming, if that's when Jesus would enter, we'd enter into the rest of God. So we'd have 6,000 years, that'd be like the six days of creation. Then, we, you know, no, that's not what Peter's saying. Peter's not giving you uh, something built to scale where you like if a model uh the other day we we had our grandson we were building one of these estes model rockets and it was a scale of one i think to a hundred so every inch would be a hundred inches in reality and that scale was one that would be reflected throughout the model that's not what Peter's doing. He's not giving you a scale that says, okay, so when you decide there's a thousand years, then a day's gone by for the Lord. What he's saying is, is 
God doesn't exist in time the way we do. Time doesn't count to God the way it does us. So we've got God and who created time. We've got time doesn't apply to God the way it does to us. He's beyond time, even as we're under it. But there's another very important biblical concept about God in related to time. And that is that God never changes over time. See, time is a way we measure change in ourselves and in the world. Even our young grandchildren, uh, uh, we've been with uh, them as well, Abigail and Lydia, if they see a candle anywhere, here's a candle, if they saw this candle lit or not, they would start singing happy birthday because they believe that the candle is calling for that song. And then they would actually try to think, they think at the end of the song, you're supposed to go, uh, it, 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 because they've seen people blow out candles at the end of singing happy birthday. Well, every time we see a candle, they're singing that song. We like to measure things as humans from an early age. And we measure birthdays because we grow with a birthday or we age with a birthday. Um, some of us, I know my mom uh, uh, has not aged at all uh, since she turned 39. And so she's, she, she may have birthdays, but they don't affect her age. But the rest of us, we age. And that's the way it works. But we, we change with time. God does not change. God said it himself in Malachi 3, verse 6. He says, I, the Lord, do not change. That's pretty blunt. It's pretty on point. Psalm 102 says something that's related to this in verses 25 through 27. Talking about God, it says, of old, got an age term there, of old you laid the foundations of the earth and the heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will wear out like a garment. You will change them like a robe. They'll pass away. But you, God, are the same. And your years have no end. Lots of Psalms reference God in this way. Psalm 90 verse 2 is, a, is another really on point Psalm. That says, before the mountains were brought forth, so before creation, before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world from everlasting backwards to everlasting future, you are God. I can remember being young and chasing this down with mom. We lived in Rochester, New York. We just moved there. So I was probably about eight years old. And I said to mom, okay, so you're my mom, dad's my dad, yes. And your mom is grandmother Catherine and granddaddy Tommy's your dad, yes. And her mom was grandmother Davis, yes. And her mom, and, and then we went, and I said, and if we keep going back, who do we get to? She said, Adam and Eve. And I said, okay, well, well, before them, well, before them, you've got God, all right? Well, before him, well, there is no before him. Well, who made God? Well, nobody made God. He's always been there. And I remember saying, but that doesn't make sense because everything's got to start. And mom said, no, Everything in our life and in our knowledge bank has a start, but God's the one who started it all. And so you've got two choices here. You can either say that something started out of nothing or something started with a cause. And what started with a cause had God already present and existing. Now, it's not a perfect way of understanding it, but it gives a really good start. And that's what the psalmist is saying. God is from everlasting back to everlasting future God. 
James says something very good and on point as well. James, the brother of Jesus, wrote in James 1.17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there's no variation or no shadow due to change. God doesn't vary. There's no shadow. There's no Look, you do not have to worry about God waking up tomorrow and deciding he doesn't like people with blue eyes. God's not going to change. You don't have to worry that maybe tomorrow God's going to decide, uh, you know, I had told people I'd give them forgiveness of their sins through Jesus, but I don't know. They've just been taking advantage of that. So I don't think I'm going to do that. God doesn't change. He's the same. There's no variation. And that's what James, the brother of Jesus, said. Now, importantly, when we understand that God's the one who doesn't change, then we begin to further understand some important passages, like Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 8. Because that passage says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. See, that's one of these biblical statements that places Jesus you know, on the, the same playing field as God the Father. Some people look at Scripture and say, well, where does it really say that Jesus is divine and that he's like God the Father? This is one of those clear places if we understand the biblical teaching on time. Uniquely, God doesn't change. And Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus Christ is God. And that's why we read in Revelation chapter 1, we get it in verse 4 and then we get it again in verse 8. Jesus in verse 8 says it with this, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord, who was and is and is to come, the Almighty. So this is Jesus, the Alpha and Omega, the one who was and is and is to come, who is the Almighty. Time as it applies to God is very different than the way time applies to you and me. So let's set that first area of God and time aside for a moment, and let's sharpen our focus on the second area, which is people and time. Humanity, you and me with time. What does the Bible have to say about you and me and time? Well, first of all, unlike God, we actually exist in time. We are creatures of time. You know, it, we, we are caught up in time. It's one of our biggest problems because it's like wearing blinders. See, so we're limited in what we see because of these time blinders we wear. We've got a God who's beyond time. For God, the future is no different than the past. It's the reason that we can trust him with our future. Because he knows these two roads are in front of you or they're in front of me and we can go left or we can go right. How many times does he tell us, go left? And we think, ah, no, 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 I'm going to go right. I know, I, I got this one. And God's like, no, I see the end of the road. I know the divergent roads and where they go. So I'm really thinking about this because time is history for us, but God, the history is the same as the future. So here's the outside of the church where I'm speaking to you from. This church was built, the main part of it, around the 1100s. It's got a burial marker out in the graveyard for crusaders who fought in the crusades. 
This church uh, has got, uh, uh, you can't really see it, but up above me, there's an old mural that, that's been covered over with paint, but it, the paint's been coming off. I mean, it's, it's, it's almost a thousand years old. But you go out, you look in the cemetery, and, and you'll see the, the monument for the Crusaders. If I'll show you a picture in the PowerPoint of this painting that's up there. That's just amazing. And so we're tied into history. I don't know if you've ever gotten on one of those websites, Ancestry.com. Been trying to chase down our history. And, and, and it's amazing, by the way, all the resources that are out there to do that. But, I mean, we've got, we've got an amazing history here among the Lanier's. We've got some really neat people. We've also got some rascal crooks. Um, it's fascinating to see who all's in there, but, but we're all tied into this fabric of history. So if humans are tied into history and it limits our vision, we can look back, but we have trouble looking forward. So we trust God for the future and we pray for God for the past. Looking back to the past, does that give us anything? I have heard that wisdom comes with age. And so I ask this question, does wisdom come with time? What does the Bible have to say about that? Well, it depends. So look just at the book of Job for a moment. You remember Job? He's the fella who has his life turned truly upside down. Loss of money, loss of health, loss of family. I mean, he's gone from being every man's dream guy dream life to being the one that everybody pities. And he's got these friends who come and sit down with him. And some of them are saying just absolutely stupid things. Some of them are saying some smart things. But you read through all of this counsel from his friends and it's really interesting what they say. So he's got one friend who in Job chapter 12, verse 12 says, wisdom is with the aged and understanding in length of days. In other words, the older you are, the wiser you are. So that's one friend in Job chapter 12. Meanwhile, another friend in Job chapter 32 verse 9 says, wisdom does not come from being old. So you got this conflicting idea here. One friend says it does. Another friend says it doesn't. Where are we going to get our wisdom from? I mean, how, how do we understand time? I look back at the past, and if I could turn back time, I would live very differently than I've lived. And I, look, I, I'm the same way. There are things I've done. If I could turn back time, uh, uh, I'd run from them. You know, Becky and I uh, have our anniversary today, and uh, I was talking to her about it, and I, I was talking, and, and I said, I think I'm a better husband today than I was when we first got married. I hope I am, because I hope God's grown me, and she uh, assured me I was, I was I'm, I'm, I'm a lot better now than I was then. <laughs> she didn't say it that way. She was very, very nice about the whole thing. Um, and she said, well, I'm sure I'm, I'm a much better spouse now than I was then. And I got to be candid. I mean, she's like been brilliant from the get-go. Um, uh, so I, I, I don't look back and, and find that. But she's, um, uh, you know, it, I look back and I wish I could do things differently. Look, how many of us have said, if I could just go back to school and redo school, there are so many classes that I would take that I would do such a better job in and I'd take so much more serious because I want to know them and learn them. We can look back and learn from it and then with age comes wisdom. Or... We can just let time go by and not give a rip and not learn any lessons at all from what we've been through. 
See, the Bible's right in both accords. With age can come wisdom, but also with age, wisdom doesn't necessarily come. The Bible actually says, if you want wisdom, ask God for it. And wisdom comes, starts with fear of the Lord, respecting God and who he is. All right, humans in time, what else does the Bible tell us? It tells us that for us, time is fleeting. You know, one of my favorite sayings that's not in the Bible is that the days are long, but the years fly by. Uh, I was talking to Rachel and Lee, uh, uh, our daughter and son-in-law, who are parents of Caleb. Now, Caleb is two years old. And Caleb is, um, isn't Caleb two years old? No, he's one year old. How? But he walks like he's two, though. Um, he doesn't talk like he's two. Caleb's one year old, but he's at the age where you can't really entertain him too much he, without him just, I, he, he doesn't express himself yet. So they were talking about having to fly home with him. And they were talking about how that, that 11 hours back to LA from London was really gonna be a, um, a strenuous chore of a flight and seemed to take forever. Because if he starts crying, there's not much you can do about it. And he may start crying if you don't let him run up and down the aisles. And then everybody on the airplane looks at you like you're a horrible parent because you can't control your kid. And they were just really, really concerned about it. And I said to them, I said, so what you're telling me is if you knew you had only 12 hours to live, you would want to spend it flying with Caleb. <laughs> And they said, oh, no, no, that's not what we're saying. I said, well, it sounds like it because you're saying it wouldn't seem like 12 hours. It seemed like a lifetime. and You'd have a whole life. They were like, oh, yeah, that's right. But our days, they fly by. The years fly by. And the Bible recognizes that. That's not a new 21st century thing that just happens to us. And that's why you read in Psalm 103, verses 15 through 16, that as for people, our days are like grass. We flourish like a flower of the field. And the wind passes over it, and it's gone, and its place knows it no more. Or how about Psalm 90, verse 10? That's the psalm that says the years of our life are 70, or even by reason of strength, 80 or more, yet their span is, in other words, the span, the length, but toil and trouble, they're soon gone and we fly away. So do we live with a perspective of time? Do we understand what we've got with time? It, it, time, how we see time is extremely important. And the biblical teaching is we can learn from it or not. The biblical teaching is we can 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 let it change the way we behave or not. The biblical teaching is that time should affect how we live. Knowing that our days are fleeting, knowing that we're but a breath, understanding time for what it is, whether it's the Ecclesiastes passage, and no, I'm not going to play the bird song for you, turn, 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 but to everything there is a season uh, and a time for everything under heaven. There's a time to be born. There's a time to die. There's a time to laugh and a time to mourn. There's a time to, to, to dance and a time to you know weep. I, I, it's all in there. And, and, and knowing that time is that way should affect how we live. I think that song, Time, by Pink Floyd has some of the most profound lyrics on time that 
serve as a bridge between this biblical declaration of how humans are bound to time, even though we tend to be ignorant about it, and how we need to live diligently understanding time. Let me read you those lyrics in case they, they didn't get Ticking away, like the ticking of a clock. Those of you who were born before the digital age will remember ticking clocks. Ticking away the moments that make up a dull day. Fritter and waste the hours in an offhand way. Kicking around on a piece of ground in your hometown, waiting for someone, waiting, waiting for someone or something to show you the way. Tired of lying in the sunshine, staying home to watch the rain. You're young and life is long. There's time to kill today. And then... One day, you find 10 years have got behind you. No one told you when to run. You missed the starting gun. And you run and you run to catch up with the sun. But it's sinking. Racing around, the lyrics actually say, racing around to come up behind you again. The sun's the same in a relative way, but you're older, you're shorter of breath, and you're one day closer to death. That's pretty profound. So if we're just frittering away and we've, life's going to be long, and we've got time to kill, and we can just lie around and wait for someone to show us the way, what's going to happen is we're going to wake up and we're going to realize all we missed. So we get to learn the way, that's the wisdom in the Bible that comes from seeking God and asking him to teach us the way. Because the end of the purpose, the maturity, the rightness for you and for me is to know God and to glorify him. By the way, that comes from the Westminster Confession of Faith. The Westminster Confession of Faith was written by the parliament that King Charles, that I was telling you about, had to call to raise the taxes so that he could go to war. That's the parliament that went to war against King Charles. That's the parliament that had Westminster write what became the template for the Presbyterian Church, the Westminster Confession of Faith. Anyway, this is a biblical concept as well, that time should teach us how we live. And this is why James, the brother of Jesus, said in James 4, verses 13 through 15, come on, come now, you who say today or tomorrow, We'll go into such and such a town. We'll spend a year there. We'll trade. We'll make a profit. People who live oriented around their own clock and their own time. James then continues and says, yet you don't know what tomorrow may bring. What, what is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. In other words, live your life oriented around what God wants you to do. Don't fritter and waste your days ticking the moments that make up a dull day. This is a biblical concept that you find over and over. The Psalms say it multiple times. My favorite place is Psalm 90, verse 12. All of Psalm 90 is almost a time psalm. But Psalm 90, verse 12 says, so teach us 
to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Okay. We need to learn because of who we are. Now, I can talk about time, but this is not the only biblical teaching on time with, with humanity. I want to also tell you, we have a longing in our heart for something more than this fleetingness. We have a longing in our heart for eternity. We all want more, and we, we want a shot at something greater. In Ecclesiastes 3, it says that God, God has made everything appropriate in its time. But he's also set eternity in our heart. We, we, we're never going to get it all put together here. We don't have everything. We, it doesn't matter how many years you live. You're never going to put it all together here. You've got eternity in your heart. You've got God and a desire for something more than you're going to have in this life. So let's, we got to move on because I'm running out of time. Get it? I'm running out of time. God in time, point one. Point two, people in time. Point three, let's look at the biblical teaching on the history and time, specifically how the Bible teaches that time and history come together. And, and in this sense, I want to draw three columns on the paper or screen because there are three different ages, in a sense, that are spoken of biblically. The first is the age, um, I'll call it the age of Eden. The second is the age of death. And the third is what I'll call the age to come. Now let's start with the age of Eden. The age of Eden is the age that that era, that span, that time in history where Adam and Eve are in this incredible garden. In Genesis 2, 8 and 9, it says, The Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east. There he put the man whom he'd formed, and out of the ground, God, the Lord God made to spring up every tree that's pleasant to sight. And every tree that's good for food. And the tree of life was in the midst of the garden. This is life in this garden. And Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden exist in an era and a time of life. And, and it continues in verse 15 of chapter 2 to say, the Lord God took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden to work it. He had work to do, to keep it. He had to figure it out. The Lord God commanded the man saying, you can eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, don't eat it. The day you eat that, you'll die. So here in the midst of life, with the tree of life, with all the good things to eat, you're going to live, you're going to, everything's great. Don't eat that. If you eat that, this age is over. And what did they do? Well, eventually they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And they changed the day they lived. They no longer lived in that, that life. But the day they ate of it, they transitioned into the day, the age, the era, the epoch, the age of death. And that transition into death is one that's talked about as early as the Genesis story as well. Because God kicks them out of the garden. They've lost that life. And when he puts them out, he says to Adam as part of the curse, by the sweat of your face, you'll eat bread till you return to the ground. This is the age of death. For God says, for out of it, you were taken your dust and to dust you shall return. Adam had never known death. Eve had never known death. They learned it. They learned it tragically as Cain slays Abel and they lose a child. They learned it through themselves. The age of death is the age into which we're born because we're their offspring living in their world. 
That's why Paul says, just as sin came into the world through one man, sin spread to everybody. Because everybody, death came in through sin. Sin spread to all. Death spread to all. Because we, we're all sinners. We all are dying. We're all in this age of death. It's the age in which we live. It's the significance. You know, we often quote John 3, 16. In fact, it'll be one of the points for home. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. In other words, we won't perish, we won't die. But the verse that I want you to look at for a moment is the last verse in John chapter three, verse 33, or 36. It's the one where, where Jesus, or John probably commenting on what Jesus said, um, whoever believes in the son has eternal life, life for all age. Whoever does not obey the son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. See, it remains. It's already there. It's not like, oh, I'm going to make God angry. No, God's wrath is already on the sin, and, the, and, and that's the death. That's the curse that we've got. The wrath of God remains on him. We're in this age of death. It's why Peter um, uh, has this interchange with Jesus in Luke 18. Peter says, lo, we, we've left everything and followed you. And Jesus said, listen to me. There's not a man that's left their house, their parents, their brethren, their wife, their children, or any, for God's kingdom's sake, who won't receive much more in this present time and in the world to come, life everlasting. Because you see, we not only have our current age of death, but the promise of Jesus is that there's an age to come. So sin came into the world and moved us to the age of death. But this is not going to be the final age. We've got the age to come. You know, Jesus puts forward a parable, and this is a, an amazing parable that, that's worth looking at. And the parable, Jesus says, is the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. See, God sowed good seed. The Garden of Eden was a good seed. But while men slept, it's a parable, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went his way. And when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, the weeds came also. So the servant of the householder came and said, hey, didn't you sow good seed in the field? From whence have the weeds come? And he said, an enemy's done this. And the servant said, well, would you like us to go and gather up the weeds? And he said, no, I'm or gather up the, the good wheat, the, the fruit. And Jesus said, no, or the master said, no, lest while you're gathering the tares, you pull up the wheat. So I guess I got that wrong. He didn't want them to pull up the weeds because they might be pulling up the wheat. That's the way to say it. So he said, uh, let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of the harvest, I'll say to the reapers, Gather up first the tares, bind them in bundles to burn, and then gather the wheat up and put it in my barn. Now, the apostles wanted to know about this, the disciples, and they said, would you tell us what this is about? And Jesus said, well, the one that sows the good seed is the son of man, and the field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. And the reapers are the angels. So like the weeds are gathered and turned into the, burned into the fire, so that is the way it's going to be at the end of the world. And that's what Jesus gives us. He gives us the end of the world. It's the age to come. And so the Son of Man will send forth his angels. They'll gather out of the kingdom all the things that offend and those which do iniquity, cast them into the furnace of fire. They'll be wailing and gnashing of teeth, but the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. 
And Jesus says, if you've got ears to hear, listen to what I'm saying. So the age of Eden leads to the age of death. But Christ promises there's an age to come. And this age to come is one that's talked about in Scripture. It's called the great day of the Lord in certain places. So you can read about it in, in Zephaniah 1, 14 through 18. It's a time of, of a day of judgment. You can read about it in uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 4, verses 9 through 11. Uh, you can read about it in 1 Thessalonians. You can read about it in Peter. You can read about it in a number of places. But this day of the Lord is one that's a day of rest. It's a day of renewal, but it's also a harsh day of judgment. Um, I urge you to take time to read about it. But I don't want to leave without telling you that a key is the transition between the age of death and the age to come because we're living in the transition. See, just as sin ushered in the age of death, the death of Christ on our behalf ushered in the age to come. There's just some cleaning up to do. But we live in that transition period. And so we're looking forward to what's coming in confidence that it's going to be there. And it affects the way we live now because we know through Christ we have eternal life. The times are changing. They are. And we don't want to sink like a stone. We want to change with them. We want to be on board with God, which brings us to our points for home. Point for home number one. First Timothy 1.17, Paul writes, To the king of ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. We worship a God beyond time. And if we understand that, it will transform our minutes, our days, our weeks, months, years, our life. Point for home two. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Jesus is saying, you have the perishing that came in with Adam. That's the age of death. You want to get out of the age of death? If you want to get out of the age of death, put your faith in Jesus. The death of Jesus for your sins puts death to death. And the resurrection of Jesus shared by you and me, is a resurrection unto eternal life, which is the age we want. And so point for home number three. Paul says suffering and all that he gets dealt in this world doesn't matter to him, doesn't bring him shame, doesn't bring him dis dis dismay, doesn't, doesn't not, none of that. Why, he says, because I know whom I believe. And I'm persuaded he's able to keep that I've committed to him until that day, the coming day. I miss you guys. I look forward to being with you teaching live. Thank you for staying together in constant communion while I'm gone. Uh, I'll see you in video thoughts for the day next uh, week, starting Monday, tomorrow. But meanwhile, I pray that God will bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you and instill upon you wisdom for today and for your life as you wait for that day where we live eternally in his presence. Amen.